All right. So first of all, my name is David Summerhays. I am a TA for this class. I'm a PhD in political thought. Normally, people who do political thought study people named John, like John Rawls or John Locke. But me, I have a background in public health, so I worked in a child welfare research for four years. So I did a lot of data. So anyway, so enough about me. Let's talk about what is a variable. Bum, bum, bum. All right, and you see that if x equals 17, causing flashbacks and shivers down the, down the spines of anyone who disliked high school algebra. Anyway, uh, but you know what? This is the kind of thing, it sounds intimidating, but it, it's pretty simple when you get down to it. The hard part is just understanding the language that's describing ways that we think every single day. Let me give you, let me just like give you some simple examples here. So a variable, it just means that the thing varies. You know, the amount of light behind me varies by the time of day. How high, how happy the plants are, whether they're wilting or growing will vary depending on the amount of light, how much I water them, which I should water them once this video is done. And variable, like research is all about understanding how variables get along. Um, and so, sure, we represent these as numbers sometimes, equals 17. If I don't eat for eight hours, I'll be hungry. My hungriness will be a 10. But if I don't eat for two hours, my hungriness should be only a five. So, you know, we translate variables into numbers sometimes. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's not too hard to understand. Um, I mean, the language is difficult, but the concepts are pretty basic. So for instance, we have two intimidating sounding names, independent variable, the one that creates the effect, and the dependent variable, the one that shows the effect. The independent variable is what you manipulate in order to affect the dependent variable. So if I put one of my plants in the shed, it's, 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 I'm, I'm not gonna do it, um, and there's no sunlight in the shed and I don't water it, it will die, whereas the other plant that stays right there on the shelf, uh, it's gonna keep living. So the independent variable would be how much sunlight, you know, whether it's in the shed or on my windowsill. And the dependent variable is whether this plant is alive or not. And if I'm interested in uh, happy plants around me, then the dependent variable is what I'm interested in. Okay, so, so it's pretty simple. Independent, you can remember that like adolescents are very independent. They're always testing the boundaries. And, and they're seeing the results of what they, of what they do. Um, that's how I remember independent variable, very independent uh, adolescents testing boundaries to see what happens um, to their dependent parents. Um, okay, but there are other types of variables that are important to keep in mind. So um, I think independent dependent is pretty clear. Uh, I could give more examples, but I, I, I think that should be all right. Um, well, for instance, I used to work in child welfare and we'd evaluate programs. So we were curious uh, whether or not, let's say, giving children in child welfare, you know, foster homes, offering therapy, how much that would impact outcomes. Well, the dependent variable that we want is happiness and uh, the independent variable is providing therapy. And how much happiness is that created? Is it worth the money that's invested in things like that? So those are just simple examples. Now, um, if we talk about other types of, types of variables, the control variable. So for instance, let's say, uh, so this, a control variable is something you try to control for in your analysis, either the way you set up the data set or uh, the way you analyze the data, because the control variable threatens the validity of what you're doing. In other words, uh, it, can, it can give you false results. So for instance, let's say I, I'm curious how, you know, how much, how, let's say everyone, I have a controlled study where 10 people eat at noon. And I'm curious how long can they work and function without needing to eat again? And, you know, this is all in the goal of healthy living, healthy lifestyle. How often do people need to eat? Is it better to eat one big meal or snack all day? Okay, so all these people eat at noon. And then I'm curious around, let's say 6 p.m., how are they feeling, how hungry are they, how much have they accomplished, all these things. So control variable. So for instance, um, let's say half of my study eats uh, like 
you know, just like McDonald's and then one third, they just eat a Tic Tac. And then an, an, another, uh, how much is left? One sixth eats, um, eats a meal that looks like the meal guide straight out of the Canadian government, uh, you know, with like half vegetables and, and all that leafy looking stuff um, polluting their plate. Um, so if I don't control what they're eating, it's gonna mess up all of my results because the one that eats the ones that eat Tic Tacs for lunch, uh, they're gonna be hungry really soon. You know, <laughs> they're gonna be irritable once they hit that sugar crash moment around like twelve oh five. Yeah, so you get the idea. Um, you need to control for these things um, in child welfare. You know, uh, maybe let's just say, just to give an example, maybe boys and girls react differently to therapy. Maybe girls are more likely to say, oh, I'd like to see a therapist. And once they get there, they're more likely to share openly and make more progress. Well, if I'm wondering about the effect of therapy, I have to control in my analysis for, uh, for gender to some degree in the way I analyze things. Or let me give another example. Uh, some kids will have had many, many problems, have a lot of functioning issues, suicide, you know, uh, depression, and, and like acting out in school and things like that, whereas others might be just fine. So you might see big effects from the ones that have big problems and small effects from the ones that are really doing okay. Um, so I need to control in my analysis for, you know, how much was there to therapize versus, you know, maybe there just wasn't that much for the therapist to do. Um, so those are control variables. You have to control for them if you want the valid results. If you want to test the thing you want to test, if you want the kind of answers you want, these are threats to your validity. Um, an intervening variable, so these are more complicated. It, it changes the relationship between the independent and dependent variable. And without getting into these different kinds of intervening variables, um, Prof Wills just told me that I don't, I don't need to exactly get super into these. But for instance, the example I gave where girls might be more interested than boys in therapy. If I just, if I set up my study so that anybody can sign up and then I get a, get like 90% girls and 10% boys in the therapy group that I study, that I set up, um, that's an intervening variable because it's, it's, it's kind of messing up. Uh, it, I didn't have a control group, right? I didn't set it up so that um, half of these people don't get therapy and they're very similar to the group that does get therapy. No, I just said, anyone who wants therapy, come on in and we're going to see how it goes. Um, you know, those are, gender might be an intervening variable that changes who signs up and the kinds of results that they get. Um, when you study what people eat, the, the digestive system is a huge intervening variable in almost any study you do about nutrition. So for instance, you can, I can tell those people that eat a Tic Tac, I can force them to eat the Canadian food guide meal, no matter how much they don't want to. And uh, I can force everybody to have the same meal and I can control for stress levels by giving them massages for 12 hours every day for a month. God, that sounds awesome. Anyway, uh, I can, uh, you know, I can control for gender and make sure it's the same thing. Um, this, that, and the other thing, uh, but I can't control that people's digestive systems will digest the same food very differently. And it's pretty hard to control for that. There's no, uh, there's not much I can do. Um, so you just have to say, well, that's a factor and we're gonna see what happens and, and, and see, you just have to say it's sort of a limit of what you do, but it's definitely an intervening variable. People might be allergic to one thing and all kinds of things. It's very hard to control for, uh, for certain factors. There you go. Uh, so I know you guys have projects coming up. So let's think about good variable selection. So there's this thing called the causal arrow. Again, this is, I don't know how these concepts end up sounding complicated when they're so super duper simple, but basically the causal arrow, you wanna make sure it's pointing in the right direction. And what that means is, uh, you know, I think the classic example from the readings this week is, um, it's not because dogs pee that trees exist. Um, you know, it's really just dog sees a tree and pees on it, but it, you know, or uh, it, it's all about causation and time. For instance, um, 
the Big Bang created the universe. The universe did not create the Big Bang, that kind of thing. So it's, it's very simple. It's just kind of saying, make sure you're studying the thing that's causing another thing. You're, you want to make sure you're studying an independent variable, variable that's happening before so that it causes the uh, dependent variable. Uh, don't select on the dependent variable. Well, that just means like it's better to have a control group. So for instance, like I said about my example with therapy, if I just say, oh, anyone who wants can sign up, uh, who are the kinds of people that are willing to sign up for therapy and who are the kinds of people that might need it but don't aren't the type to sign up or maybe it's only certain agencies in child welfare that promote it properly. So you, you have to, you can't just say, oh, this is the thing I want to study. You have to sort of, um, uh, you have to create controls or ways of, of making sure that you're actually studying what you want to study. So pick a dependent variable that has a good connection to your question. Well, if I'm curious about what's going to help the uh, children in child welfare, I won't be studying the stars and the moons like the astronomers, right? It, I mean, it's pretty obvious, but I just think, to, uh, you know, it doesn't hurt to say a couple of these things. Um, you want to choose dependent variables that have a good connection to the question. So, for instance, and, and this, is, this has to do with making sure you can figure out how to measure them. So if your variable can't be directly measured, then you need to find something you can measure. So for instance, we gave the example of the digestive system being super weird. You can't measure it whether or not it's happy. You know, if, you, if your question is, is the digestive system happy? Um, that's pretty hard to measure. You can measure whether or not people self-report that it feels good, um, that their, their belly feels good. You can measure self-report of people being happy or therapists saying that their clients are happy. That's pretty hard to measure whether or not someone is functioning. So you just have to think about how you operate, operationalize your research. It's how do you put it into practice? How do you find indicators that indicate that what you think is happening is really happening?